Hi, I'm Selena, and this is not the background that you're used to seeing in the last couple of videos. And that's because I'm filming this video way in advance so that I can be near all the books that I need to be near. Um, but I'm actually at school right now. And today we're going to be talking about my top 15 favorite non-fantasy. These books are not necessarily non-fantasy standalones, but they are non-fantasy books, like non-traditional fantasy. There's some you could maybe argue are on the line, or they're, they're more like non-SFF books, but these are not SFF books in my opinion, and they are still books that I love and want to talk about. It's just hard to compare them to the SFF that I've read. So let's just get started. As I said last time, the bottom five, so like numbers 15 to 11 are more like honorable mentions, so I'm going to breeze through those. And my top 10 are my real top 10 as of now, as of the time I'm filming this in January of 2021. And I'll redo the video when I have more. But I find that my list of non-fantasy books is changing less in terms of favorites because I read less of these books in general and love less of them in general when I do read them. But I'm sure that in a couple of years or a year or whatever, I'll have some updates for you. But getting into it, my number 15 pick is It by Stephen King. This, if you somehow don't know what it is about, is a small town horror book kind of, except it's very not small, it's like a thousand pages, following a group of kids who their town is being terrorized by this clown that captures children and they none of the adults really believe them and this group of children has had various run-ins with the clown and are trying to figure out how to stop it and then you also follow these kids years and years later it's dual timeline once they've grown up and have all left dairy and are now having to come back because this threat is emerging again. This is definitely supernatural horror and I was just in awe about what Stephen King could do with a book like this. He this book is a thousand pages, but I always felt engrossed. I never felt like he wasted a word. I felt like the horror, he used it in such a way that it was human, even though it's a supernatural horror book. It felt scary because of the realistic aspects of it. And I also feel like he uses a lot of social issues in here to make his point. However, this book has been accused of racism and homophobia, and I just want to put that out there. I really enjoyed this book, but that doesn't mean that it's flawless and that I don't recognize those flaws. So I just want to put that out there with this one. Also, it needs a ton of trigger warnings, so I will leave those in the pinned comment, along with any other trigger warnings for any other book on this list, as usual. Number 14 on this list is not one that I have physically right now because I've loaned it out, and that book is one that I used to recommend a ton in my personal life before I had a booktube channel, um, and I felt like it was my mission in life to get people to read this book, and so I feel like it deserves to be here even though I don't have such strong feelings about it anymore. And that book is The City in the City by China Miebel. This is a really weird book that's hard to describe, but basically it's a crime fiction book, but with a twist. China Miebel takes different genres and then he puts twists on them. And this particular twist is we follow two cities that occupy overlapping geographical space, but have very distinct yet somewhat related cultures and are genuinely very, very close to each other but that ignore each other. The citizens are basically not to really acknowledge each other's existence, but when a murder happens that connects the two cities in a way they don't really want to be connected, we follow a detective from one of the cities who has to investigate it and where he goes will take him into the realm of conspiracy theory and maybe into the other city. I just thought this book was masterful in how it was put together and the themes it tackled, the plot it tackled, and I just thought it was great, really unique, really stellar. Number 13 is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I didn't love everything about the ending of this book. Um, as usual, this is actually two books, Little Women and Good Wives, um, as they're usually um, sold in a bind up in America. But I did really enjoy this anyways. It was the first classic that I read and was like, huh, maybe I could like a wide variety of classics. It really got me into the type of book. I read it for class and I annotated it and I just loved reading this. It was such a great experience and I gave it five stars and it still means a lot to me. I think the story is beautiful, etc. Number 12 made it to my favorite books of the year and I'll link that up there in the eye in the corner. Um, and that book is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. This is my favorite literary fiction I've read so far, and we follow basically two light-skinned yet black women who their lives go very different places as one of them returns to her old childhood town with a dark-skinned daughter and her sister, 
passes as a white woman and marries a white man and moves to the north. This is a very elegantly told book with a lot of interesting um, family dynamics and different very unique ways of telling the story and I really really enjoyed it. I thought it was so engrossing, so beautifully written, so emotional and disturbing at times but good and very focused on family dynamics that are a lot more complicated than it may seem. My number 11 is kind of a cheat, definitely a cheat, because I'm doing two books here because I read them around the same time and I can't really remember which one I like more or which one I would like better now and so I'm just gonna put them both here and they're by the same author so whatever they're not even in the same series they're not even series but they are The Song of Achilles and Circe by Madeline Miller. These are both like Greek myth retellings. Song of Achilles follows the story of Achilles from Patroclus's eyes and Circe follows Circe's story past what you know about her from the Odyssey and I really really loved how this story gave agency to its characters and reimagined a different world for these myths to take place in or reimagined a different a different kind of myth in the same world and I just thought it was such an interesting interpretation and I loved it. These were some of the first adult books I ever read and they really stuck with me. My number 10 is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. So this is a post-apocalyptic literary fiction type book. We follow a lot of different characters as they are um, basically going through the aftermath of this plague that has wiped out most of the human population. We follow a Shakespeare troupe that sort of travels from settlement to settlement, performing Shakespeare, which is the last vestige of the old life. We have a lot of characters whose plots are interconnected and intersect in very interesting ways. We see flashbacks of their lives before the plague hit or the, the bird flu, I think is what it was called, hit and their lives after and what happened to them. And it really is about human connection and human relationships, even in um, such times. And it made me think about a lot of things about pandemics and plagues and things that I was not thinking about, but I could not stop thinking about when I when 2020 happened. <laughs> I read this in 2019 um, and I love this book. I would highly recommend it, but not if you're not gonna wanna read about, you know, apocalyptic pandemics right now. Number nine on this list is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Also maybe Through the Looking Glass. I like them both pretty equally, but they're both so short. I sort of just think of them as one, I don't know. But yeah, the Alice books are on this list because I loved these books. I They were one of the first classics that I got into other than like Little Women and some Jane Austen. This was probably my next one that I got into and I was surprised with how much I loved it because I had tried to read this book before. I'd read it before when I was a kid and it never really spoke to me or struck me or was easy for me to get through. Like the classic language was still not really easy for me and then I read it for a class and I was shocked at how readable I found it and how smart I found it and how just, I don't know, just meaningful it was to me. And this is a very nonsensical children's classic, if you somehow don't know, but a girl named Alice who falls down a rabbit hole and goes into a very illogical world called Wonderland. I think that the magic of this book is timeless in my opinion. I feel like there's a reason why this has survived so long and there's also even more personal reasons why this spoke to me. I saw myself in this book in a lot of ways and in really abstract weird ways and I connected with it so so hard and I have collected copies of this book. I don't, I think my love for it has died down a little bit because I've read a lot of good books um, and a lot of good classics but this one still holds a really, really special place in my heart and I can't imagine it not making this list ever, pretty much. It's a story I can't wait to pass it on to my children and it's a story that I love to reread and get something new out of every time I do. Number eight used to be higher on this list, but I feel like I've gotten into a fantasy a lot more and less into realistic stuff. And that book is An Every Morning The Way Home Gets Longer and Longer by Frederick Bachman. This is my favorite Bachman book um, still as of now. And it is a very short sort of novella about a son, a grandson, and a grandfather who are all dealing with the fact that the grandfather is losing his memories to dementia. It is really just a character and relationship and life exploration rather than it is a plotted book. And it has sort of a whimsical feeling because most of it takes place inside the grandfather's mind. I thought this was such a beautiful but heartbreaking book and very bittersweet book that spoke to me and 
spoke to things that my family has gone through really, really well. And I've reread this once already. I cried even more the second time. It's just such a beautifully constructed book that means so much to me. And I highly, highly recommend it if you haven't given this a try yet and if you think you can handle it. Number seven on this is another cheating pick and that is The Hunger Games and Catching Fire both. These I feel better about because I'm not putting the whole series. I'm just putting these first two because I did not like Mockingjay and because they do go together because they are a series but I can't pick between them. I love both of these books so much. Like The Hunger Games is the first and it's kind of the quintessential start of the series and start of the phenomenon, but Catching Fire is such a good sequel. I love these books so much when I reread them, not this past year, but in 2019. And it became one of my favorite series, even though Mockingjay was such an awful conclusion in my opinion. Um, I love these so much. These are my favorite dystopians. When I read these, I was struck with how timeless and classic they are and how relevant they are and how just extremely emotional and hard and disturbing they are and if you want to hear me talk more about this I actually have a dedicated kind of video about why I love The Hunger Games so much. It's very old and probably not very articulate in it or very comfortable in front of a camera but it's you know no, it's one that I've decided to leave up, so I think I have that at least. I will link that if it's still up. <laughs> but yeah, I just love these books so much, and I think that they definitely deserve to be on a list of my favorite non-fantasy books, because even though they have, like, sci-fi elements, like, they're dystopian. Like, is there any other, like, way to describe them? No. Dystopian. Number six on this list is one that I read and didn't love and then reread the la this past year and loved so much. It spoke to me so deeply and that is Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. This book just took bits of my mind and put it into a book or at least that's what it felt like. Do you ever read a book that feels like it's sort of written for you and written with you in mind? Mrs. Dalloway sort of felt like that to me. This is a really um hmm not very plot focused book and if you know me you know that I'm I need a plot usually but this I don't know the writing and the characters and the explorations were just enough for me this is a stream of consciousness plot plotless book and if that doesn't sound good to you I would not recommend it but if you are someone who really likes to um really dig deep into the psyches of characters and bounce around from multiple perspectives um in the drop of a pin I think that this would be really good for you if you're someone who likes a raw look at humanity and specifically what it looks like to hurt I think this would be really good for you you basically follow this woman called Miss Dalloway and various other characters in her life but primarily this veteran who she doesn't actually know um Septimus Smith both Mrs. Dalloway and Septimus Smith are um, going about their day. This takes place in the one in one day, um, and they are kind of both assaulted with memories of their past. And it's very, it's quite debilitating to especially Septimus because he is a veteran and he is having um, post traumatic stress memories come up. Whereas Mrs. Dalloway is more reflecting on her life and just the way that their memories are portrayed as like so vivid and and interacting with their present I thought was just so astute and just really really interesting that Virginia Woolf like decided to do that and um portray that and there's so many human trails of emotion and memory in here that I just think are so profound I don't know it, it spoke to me really hard <laughs> Number five to me is really hard to place and to call a favorite because it's one that I can always come back to and that I love so much, but it also is hard to compare to ones, to novels that I love for their plot and their profoundness, like The Hunger Games or Miss Dalloway or whatever. And I do think this is profound, but just in a very simple, again, plotless way. And that is The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Maxey. So this is basically just like a little, I don't know, I've seen it called a comic and I might be inclined to agree, like a little comic about a couple of friends, a boy, a mole, a fox, and a horse who all basically become friends and go through life together and teach each other like life lessons. There's lots of beautiful art and there's just like a couple of words on each page and it's a lot about like just weathering the struggles of life and the things that you will likely go through and how it's better to go through them with friends. There's a lot of little nuggets of wisdom in here that I love and find really, really emotional. Um, and 
I don't know, I highly recommend it for most people because it's not a book that you're gonna, that I feel like is going to appeal to some people because, you know, different plots or characters appeal to some people. Like, I feel like the messages in this could appeal to a lot of people because that's really what it is. It's a message book. And I love it specifically for how it appeals to me. We are into the top four, which are really hard to tell apart, but I'm gonna try, and my number four is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. This is a classic domestic thriller, basically. We follow this woman who is an unnamed narrator who basically marries a man named Maxim very quickly and is whisked away to his estate, and she finds out pretty quickly that his estate is, hmm kind of haunted by the memory of his dead wife, not in like a literal ghost sense, but his staff and himself, um, our main character perceives them as very much obsessed with Rebecca, his late wife, her name was Rebecca, and struggles to sort of fit in there because of that, but things get pretty dark. It is a domestic thriller. I can't really say much more than that because I don't want to spoil it for you. I found this very, very readable despite its very stylized prose, and I found it just absolutely gripping and I was unable to put it down because I just loved reading this so much even when it was dark even when the characters weren't you know the greatest people to follow I just thought it was so engaging and I loved watching these kind of messed up people live their lives in a kind of gothic setting and I loved uncovering the secrets of this mansion I, I love this book so much it is so good I can't recommend it higher I've said this about all of them but they're my favorite books so what are you gonna do? Number three on this list is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. So I love this book. I've read this book three times now. I've taken a whole class on this book. I love Pride and Prejudice so much. It is such a comforting read to me. It's so familiar. I love watching the movies. I love watching the TV show, the BBC miniseries. I love reading the book. It's at the point where I know a lot of the lines by heart at this point or I can sort of like bring them to mind pretty easily. I love the characters. I love how much Jane Austen put into creating this book and put into creating these characters and their arcs and how much time she took with it. It's just such a comforting thing for me because it is so familiar and because it is such a sweet sort of plot. It has its like more scandalous moments of course and it has its really funny biting commentary but it also just has really great familial um, like sisterly bonds and a sweet romance like a a fun romance. It's just a fun, bright book and I'm forever grateful for that <laughs> with this book. Every time I read it, I love it more. Every single time I read, and read it, I just sink back into it and sink deeper into loving it. I love all the adaptations. I, I love this book so much. I am like fully on board with the phenomenon that this book is and it's, it's number three on the list. It's in my top three. What else can I say? What else can I say? However, that is not my favorite Jane Austen book, but my favorite Jane Austen book is number two, and that is Emma by Jane Austen. I don't need to say her name, we've said it 10 times. Emma is a little bit less well known than Pride and Prejudice, but it's Jane Austen, so it's still pretty well known. Um, and where Pride and Prejudice is more romance focused, Emma is more focused on the development of a single character. Emma, who is incredibly flawed, incredibly selfish at times, and can be kind of callous, rude, snobby, etc. And she can be kind of nosy, she likes to match make and get into people's business basically. And she's rich, she doesn't need to marry, she's not constrained by, you know, her father's wills or her financial status, which a lot of Jane Austen's protagonists are. Um, Emma is very free-spirited and she can kind of do her own thing and it makes her a little bit of a tyrant in her own life and other people's lives. Um, but I love her. I love Emma. I think she's so lovable. I think her arc is beautiful from the beginning of this book to the end. We see so much growth from Emma and it is her character that makes me fall in love with this book and the growth we see from her. The humor we see from her and her, her town and Jane Austen's commentary. I love this book because of Emma. Also, I think that this has a really intricate plot for a Jane Austen book. I think that we see Emma's plot and because Emma is so self-centered, Emma misses a lot of the things going on behind the scenes and so there's kind of other like secrets in the town that sort of run alongside Emma's plot that Emma doesn't see because as I said, she's so self-centered. And it's so fun to like see those clues, see what Jane Austen was setting up once you go back and reread it. It's so fun to kind of see what she 
does and what she can pull the wool over your eyes about because you're so focused on Emma. I think this book is masterfully written. I think Pride and Prejudice at times can be more of a comfort read for me, but this is the book that I feel like, in my opinion so far, shows off Jane Austen's prowess as an author the best. And finally, number one on this list, I'm sure it's kind of, I don't know, predictable, but it's been the number one on this list for so long. It's not necessarily my favorite book, like my one book to rule them all. I don't know that I have one of those and it's really hard for me to compare like my fantasy favorites like Stormlight to books like this. Um, and so I don't really know. It's one of my favorite books. It's been my favorite book for the longest time. It's the book that I've said is my favorite book for the longest time when people ask me. It's still what I say um, if they ask me for just one. It's the one that has so much nostalgia to me but also holds up as a good story and one that speaks to me. Um, partially because of that nostalgia and partially just because I love it. And that book is The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I don't even know where to start with this book. This is like a fable French translated classic and it's a children's classic and we basically just follow a um, pilot as he is crash landed in the desert and a little prince from an asteroid away from Earth also crash lands on a similar spot and they try and survive together. The little prince tells him his story. It is so short. It's got beautiful like little illustrations. They're kind of in like a small form with this little book, but I have like bigger and like colored ones. I was given this book when I was nine years old um, by my aunt and I read it and I didn't know what to think about it. And then I sort of sat on it for a bit and talked about it with some people and realized that I loved it and would reread it. And it just always means so much to me. It's made me cry. It's made me laugh. It's made me it feels very familiar to me in a similar way that Pride and Prejudice does, but it, it's been with me for longer. It feels like an old friend. It feels like a remnant from my childhood and a gift for my family um, that I was given. I, I wouldn't say it's like for everybody, definitely. It's very absurdist. It's very like fable-like and it, a lot of people just don't love it, but I certainly do. I think it is beautiful and amazing. And it's it, a lot of people are like, I don't understand what it's trying to say and I can safely say like I'm no better I don't always understand what it's trying to say either I just know I love it when it says it there's so many beautiful quotes that, I, that have stuck with me and have I've taken with me <sighs> I'm not holding the copy that my aunt gave me but that copy is like my prized possession because it has her um like her note to me in it and it just it, it feels like if you want to know me you gotta know this book and you gotta know what it means to me does that make sense? Maybe it does deserve to be number one. I mean, it does, but a lot of these books do, but this might be the most number one of all of them. Whoa, we almost fell over. All right. Thank you for watching this video about my favorite non-SFF books. Let me know if any of these are your favorites. Tell me what your favorite genre is to read and what are some books that aren't from your favorite genre, but that you also love. Let me know if they match any of mine and I will see you in the next video. Bye.